I'm delighted to welcome you to um, uh, today's meeting of the seminar series on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Eliza Gordon from Northwestern University, uh, where Eliza is a research associate professor in the uh, Institute for Healthcare Studies and the <coughs> Department of Surgery. Um, Eliza earned her MD, I'm sorry, her PhD in medical anthropology at Case Western, uh, did a year with us as an ethics fellow at the McLean Center, and then completed a master's degree uh, at UIC in public health, where she specialized in community health. Um, Eliza has, over, has published over 50 peer-reviewed publications, and her research interests include the ethics of organ transplantation and donation, uh, healthcare access and outcome disparities, research ethics, and chronic illness management. Uh, currently, Eliza serves on the Ethics Committee of UNOS, uh, on the board of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, and as the director of CTEC. CTEC stands for the Chicago Transplant Ethics Consortium, a group that um, does research and writing on current topics in organ transplantation. Uh, it's a very active group, and um, they, they, they meet, I guess, weekly by telephone mm -hmm. uh, and computer. So with, uh, I'm delighted that Eliza will be talking to us today about ethical challenges in informed consent for living donors. <coughs> Welcome. So um, thank you, Mark. I, I really appreciate um, the invitation to come and um, speak to um, you and, and your colleagues here. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be a part of this um, transplant um, lecture series. So um, I've been doing some uh, research in informed consent for living donation for the past several years, and this is kind of a, a nice synthesis of some of these ethical issues. So um, can you all hear me okay? Great. All right. So. Um, what I want to do is start off with providing the basic you know, groundwork of the definition of informed consent and um, move into um, how informed consent pertains to transplantation and specifically living donation. I feel like I need a, uh, a stepping stool because I want to see everyone over the screen. Um, I also will go into um, some of the epidemiological context about living donation because that helps set the scene or give you a little bit of important background um, to understand what's going on in the minds of living donors. Um, then I'll move into some of the ethical issues in living donation and really zero in more on the ethical issues in informed consent. Um, if there's time, I'll present some of the findings of one of my research studies um, and also then conclude with some uh, future directions and interventions that uh, may help to improve informed consent. So um, just to start off with um, a basic definition of informed consent, um, that can be described as an informed consent is an autonomous authorization by individuals of a medical intervention or of involvement in research that occurs if and only if a patient or subject with substantial understanding and in substantial absence of control by others intentionally authorizes a professional to do something. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, there are several required elements of informed consent, and informed consent is a process. Um, it entails um, clinician and transplant candidate or, or patient or researcher communication, and it's designed to assess in this case, transplant candidates or living donor, potential donors, competency to make decisions, um, the disclosure of information regarding the risks, benefits, alternatives, the procedure, um, and assurance of donor comprehension of disclosed information. And informed consent involves an, an, a voluntary decision and agreement to undergo the suggested procedure. So obtaining informed consent upholds the principle of self-determination and supports autonomous treatment decisions consistent with a candidate's or potential donor's life goals, values, and beliefs. Okay. Um, 
So informed consent applies to any treatment procedure um, in the context of clinical research or treatment or research. Um, and informed consent for surgery is an ethical obligation, a legal requirement, and part of the patient's rights condition of Medicare participation for hospitals. So um, Medicare has its own very uh, specific requirements when it comes to informed consent in the transplant context. So in the context of transplantation, um, these conditions of Medicare participation specify that each patient undergoes an extensive process of informed consent. It begins at referral and then ends with the written consent for surgery. And so CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the OPTN specify very particular information that should be disclosed to potential living donors. And you can even go um, to the UNOS website and look at the revised policy. It was revised just last month or two months ago. Okay. All right, so um, with regard to living donors, there are some specific required elements that need to be disclosed. Um, the Advisory Committee on Organ Transplantation, ACOT, um, of the United States Department of Health and Human Services has established standards for informed consent for living donors. And in particular, they state that living donors must be informed about the risks, benefits, and alternatives to the donor and to the recipient. Okay, so in a way, there are, there's more than just the donor's life at stake. There's also the recipient's life at stake. And so it, it really requires balancing an extra set of perspectives when, when um, considering informed consent. The Living Kidney Donor Follow-Up Consensus Conference stressed the need to inform living donors about the risks specific to themselves. And I'll get into the rationale for why that's important in, in just a couple minutes. But um, just keep that in mind so when I discuss some of my own research, you'll um, remember that. And then um, respect for autonomy means that living donors have the right to determine how much risk they are willing to accept, and that living donors, as well as recipients, have the right to refuse the donation. So just because a potential donor wants to donate doesn't necessarily mean that the recipient will accept it. Okay, and um, as I mentioned, the OPTN has just revised their policy um, and uh, updated their content that has to be disclosed. So, um, in addition to um, the reason I just mentioned about why it's important to undergo informed consent, um, there are a couple other things to keep in mind. One is that informed consent is important for ensuring patient safety, especially in high-risk clinical situations. You want to make sure that donors in particular know what they're getting themselves into. Okay. Um, as well, there's been some um, really interesting research showing that um, being prepared for your surgical procedure in, in surgery um, more broadly, um, and having realistic expectations are associated with better post-surgical patient health outcomes. So for example, people have better functional health outcomes, perceived health, quality of life, greater engagement in their post-operative care, all those things. So in being informed means, or being prepared means it really relies on being informed. So the two kind of go hand in hand. Okay, so now I'd like to um, provide a little bit of epidemiological background about living donation. Um, so living donation has been performed essentially to remedy the organ shortage. Um, you know, deceased, there's only so many deceased donations and living donations offer a nice um, supplement to uh, address the shortage. So living kidney donation has been going on since 1954. Um, adult to adult living donor liver transplantation has been going on um, in across the you know throughout the world since 1989 but in the United States since 1998 um, there are over 95,000 patients waiting for a kidney transplant and um, in 2012 16,000 received one and uh, with regard to liver over 15,000 patients are waiting for a liver and only 6,000 received one so there's um, a much different, um, I guess, magnitude of, of the need and, and difference um, between um, who is waiting and who's receiving one. And then um, about a third of all kidney transplants are um, 
come from living donors, and then about 4% of all liver transplants are from adult living donors. <clears throat> Just to continue a bit, um, so living donation rates have really um, declined over the last several years, and um, you can see that um, the peak was um, in 2004 for kidneys. It was up to 6,600, um, but it, it's dropped more recently to 5,600. Um, and the same goes for livers. It's, it's dropped um, from 2001 to 2012. Um, it's just been this ongoing trend. And there have been a number of speculations as to why this has been going on, but no firm definitive answer. Um, there have been a couple ideas. Um, it's, the decline has been attributed to the less availability of living donors, given that um, you know family members tend to donate, but the, the donor, the recipients tend to be a little bit older. Economic factors, having to get out, um, having to not um, be at work, and then taking the paid leave or taking leave and not getting paid. Um, that's been a, another key issue that people have suggested. Um, some programs may not encourage living donation, particularly some programs may not um, have a living liver donor programs. Very few in the country have those. Um, and then a number of well-publicized uh, living donor deaths, uh, there are more than four, but this is the four I was thinking of, um, have raised con a lot of concerns about the safety of the donor procedure. So um, I'd like to turn to some of the ethical issues in, in living donation, and um, the, the three key ones are the issues of non-maleficence, the categorical imperative, and informed consent. So let's turn to issues of non-maleficence first, or do no harm. Um, a key issue of concern, particularly for surgeons cutting into um, a, a potential donor, is that it presents a lot of serious harms. You're, you're cutting into someone who is otherwise a healthy living person, okay? And, and they don't need any kind of, um, they will not gain any kind of medical benefit through the process of undergoing surgery. So those, um, this really um, counters the whole um, imperative to do no harm. We can see here in this chart um, that there's magnitudes of difference between living donor, living liver donors and living kidney donors in terms of the um, complications and outcomes. So for, for kidney, you see 0.03% you know, chance of mortality, um, whereas for liver, it's 0.4%. So, um, and then uh, with regard to the major complications for kidney, 3 to 6%, whereas uh, Clavian grade two refers to the moderate um, complications. Grade three is like really severe. So 48% get moderate kinds of complications. And then with regard to mild complications, 22% of kidney donors uh, experience those, whereas 42. So living liver donors have, I would say, magnitudes greater more you know risk that they're undertaking. And what's interesting is that while a lot of the complications do get resolved, say within months to a year, um, there are some that emerge um, after a year. So um, at uh, Dr. Uh, Michael um, Abacassis, who's the chair of our transplant program at Northwestern, he and other members of the Adult to Adult Live Liver Donor Transplant Consortium, or A2ALL, they, um, and a series of nine transplant centers doing adult to adult living donor transplant um, consolidated their data and found that um, a lot of living liver donors experienced complications um, after one year. You know, after one year, after two years, after three years, four years, five years, six years post donation. So um, that remains a problem. Another concern is the issue of the categor categorical imperative, um, basically using people as a means to an end. 
I mean, essentially, living donors are um, undergoing the surgery to help another person. They're not doing it for themselves. So that is a concern. Um, I posted up here, actually, you know what I want to do is pull this out. Um, I'm going to show you um, this special issue of narrative inquiry in bioethics, okay? Um, <laughs> Dan, you, you know what I'm talking about. So there's this journal that um, Jim Dubois at St. Louis University, um, he um, is the uh, editor of, and uh, we have a special issue on living donation and, in, and informed consent in this issue. So what um, is included in here is I have a brief intro, but the, the bulk of that special issue, and I can pass this around if anyone's interested to take a look. Um, but the bulk of the, the stories are um, the stories of actual living donors and what they went through. And some were good and some were bad. And some were in the middle or you know, kind of a mix. So um, some of those contributor, contributors who were living donors said, you know, I am more than a live organ donor, or I am not just a kidney source. In a way, it's like these affirmative statements is kind of, are kind of like, well, uh, trying to really address this. I'm, I'm asserting, I'm, no, I'm not a means to an end. In a way, it's kind of like reaffirming that they are. And then there's this whole website, um, living donors are people too. You know, all of this just suggests that people are, the living donors are, are grappling with this issue. Okay. Okay. And now um, I want to go into um, issues of informed consent for living donors. And I put voluntariness first um, as opposed to at the end, which, you know, typically kind of comes later on when people give a voluntary consent. Because I think voluntariness or undue pressure sets the tone for living donors and, and what they're going through. So let me give you some more details to that. Okay, so um, the living donors um, sense of undue pressure is framed largely by the um, available treatment options for the potential recipient. Okay, so with kidneys, um, you know, kidney transplant candidates, they have dialysis. Okay, it's not the best. Transplantation is better. Um, and of course, you know, when their AV access is all used up, then they really have no other choice but transplantation. But really, dialysis is an alternative. So there's less pressure on the potential donor to donate to a kidney transplant candidate. Whereas with liver transplant candidates, there's no alternative but death. Okay? So be, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of the potential living liver donor, what are you going to do? I mean, either see your loved one die or, you know, consider the idea of, of, of donating. So we're really working within the high stakes arena of, of life and death, particularly for the liver donor candidates. Okay, so what kinds of pressures do people, do potential donors feel? Okay, um, there's been quite a number of studies that um, have documented undue pressure um, among potential donors, kidney and, and liver donors, whether it's internal feelings, family pressures, cultural <laughs> expectations, people feeling guilt, financial um, pressures that they have to do it because the, 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 the recipient is the breadwinner and they got to support them, um, their senses of obligation or duty. Some people will say, um, I have no choice but to save the life of a loved one, especially the case in, in pediatric uh, patients. Um, there's also a gender disparity issue that's been documented around the world where um, females donate more um, than do males do. So females donating to their, their husbands is quite common. And so, you know, how does that contribute to the sense of obligation and pressure? So um, there's been some great work by Miriam Valapur in Minnesota who found that 40% of living kidney donors reported some pressure to donate, okay? And what's interesting is that they found that significantly more pressure was found, uh, was felt among those donating to related recipients as opposed to unrelated 
So the, those family ties that bind really do bind, I guess. And um, I had conducted a systematic review of living liver donors um, and found that undue pressure, rates of undue pressure varied internationally with lowest rates in the United States, moderate rates in Europe, and the highest rates in Asian countries. And I wanted to give you a quote here, again, from the narrative inquiry um, special issue by one of the donors. Um, and she said, the psychologist explained to me that I could decline to donate, and they would tell my brother that a medical issue came up during testing which disqualified me as a donor. That plan may work for people who never have to see each other again, but families are forever connected, even with the feelings of entitlement, the flawed relationships, and disappointments. Permission to back out needed to come from my brother and my parents, not from a psychologist that would never see me again. So I, I thought that that was really quite telling of what's really going on in people's experiences. Okay. Um, now, with regard to informed information disclosure, um, this issue brings up a whole host of additional issues. So, um, potential uh, living donors must obtain the necessary information to understand the procedure and its outcomes in order to effectively decide if donating coincides with their values and beliefs. Okay. Um, however, as again from this special issue, um, one person noted, all I needed to know, all I really needed to know, I learned after my donation years later, still learning. So um, I'll describe for you in a little bit more detail now what some of these issues are. So one is a lack of information to disclose. There's um, relatively little known about the long-term outcomes in transplant recipients, particularly, or recipients and donors, excuse me, um, particularly in um, the case of liver donors, okay? Um, and then um, another issue is that there's always this issue of how much information do you disclose? We don't want to overburden people with too much information um, and cause overloads that they stop paying attention and zone out. Um, and you know, some ethicists have commented about you can never really be fully informed, but you can be relevantly informed to be able to appreciate what um, some of the data mean. And opinions do vary um, within the transplant field about the amount and specificity of information that is needed by potential living donors as well as recipients. Another key problem is that there's um, a lot of variation across transplant centers in the types of information disclosed during living kidney donation inform informed consent processes. So uh, a couple studies um, demonstrate this. Um, an international study of uh, 221 transplant professionals found um, that U.S. transplant centers were more likely to disclose potential travel expenses and loss of work income than non-transplant, non-U.S. transplant centers. Uh, a study of consent processes for living kidney donors in 132 U.S. programs found that 58, excuse me, 57 percent of the programs presumed candidates' consent to undergo evaluation, as opposed to, you know, asking them. And um, other transplant programs varied in the extent to which the informed consent elements were disclosed. Only 42% of those programs disclosed all of the elements of informed consent, you know, risks, benefits, alternatives, all those things. Another international study found that 30% of 203 transplant professionals had discussed the long-term risks of premature cardiovascular disease or death with living kidney donor candidates. Um, in one of the studies I did, I assessed uh, consent forms across transplant centers and found that with regard to the readability, they were written at a college reading level. So there are health literacy issues. So um, information is inconsistently disclosed and within providers perhaps, across providers, across centers. And a concern is that um, a lack of any kind of standardization of the consent process may result in under-informing patients. <clears throat> Another key concern is that patients report being inadequately informed and having unmet information needs. 
So a number of studies for both living liver donors and living kidney donors have documented you know, precisely this, that they're neither well-informed or prepared. They desired more information to prepare for the donation. They had unmet information needs. They didn't feel that the information was um, really well explained. Um, they didn't understand the procedures for testing and surgical procedures. Um, furthermore, um, with regard to a lack of understanding, some had limited knowledge about the risks. The, um, found that uh, living liver donors um, perceived unrealistically low risks. Uh, they had a difficult time appreciating the risks. In a way, all of these sentences kind of blend together and, and you know, capture a kind of a, a sense of this um, issue about people not really quite getting the risks. Okay. Um, and then here's an issue about expectation. So, Donors experience greater morbidity than, than they expected, uh, more painful surgery and recovery than they expected. They thought their explanations didn't match their experiences. And, and what was interesting, there's only this one study that looked at associations um, among those who reported feeling less informed and found that those who were less informed were more likely to report that the donation was harmful to their health and that they were inadequately prepared for poor recipient outcomes. So um, now I'd like to kind of switch gears a little bit and turn to um, you know, the, the, the relationship between disclosure and comprehension. And the two kind of go hand in hand here. So a key question is how much understanding is sufficient for valid consent? Um, and as I alluded to earlier, the goal is not so much full understanding but substantial understanding. Uh, you can't really give everyone every single detail um, but you can try to cover the key grounds that would be material to their decision making. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions that comes up is how should clinicians ensure patients' understanding? You know, you certainly don't want to ask people, did you understand that? And, you know, people will nod their heads. Um, certainly um, the uh, um, teach back to goal is an, is an option, um, but generally no formal assessment of comprehension is used by transplant centers that at least that, I, that I've um, documented and seen documented in the literature. Um, and this is a problem particularly given that CMS conditions for hospital participation specify that there needs to be an assessment um, conducted. Um, how's our time? Do we have like 15, 15 minutes? Great. Okay. Good. All right. So what I'd like to do is um, give you uh, <clears throat> an example of some of the findings from my research that I've done on living liver donors. Okay. So what I did was investigated prospecting living liver donors comprehension, information needs, and decision making. We, um, so I conducted semi-structured interviews, used Likert scales, and so all of the living liver donors who consecutively came into our transplant center and were evaluated, participated, were invited to participate in this study after they completed their final phase of evaluation. So this is just two days before the actual surgery. Um, that might affect the findings. Um, so after they completed their final phase and informed consent, um, and this was between 2009 and 2011 at Northwestern. Okay, so I had interviewed 30 living liver donors. And just to put this into perspective, 30 is a large sample, believe it or not, but um, uh, at Northwestern we do about um, you know, 17 living adult to adult live liver donor transplants a year. And Northwestern is one of you know, nine leading transplant centers in the A2L consortium. So that's among the high end in, in, in the country. So 30 is a nice size sample to, to help you understand this. So, um, okay. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out was that there's a big fissure uh, between being perceived as informed and perceiving that they understood the information. 
So 90% rated on a Likert scale that they were informed about donation a great deal. So like a, a five on the Likert scale. That's the very end. Um, by contrast, 66% reported that they understood the information about donation a great deal. So there's something going on here. There, I would hope that they would match up on the high end. <clears throat> and one of the things I was really interested in looking at is, is their level of interest in, in learning about the risk information. You know, how much did they want it? How much did they appreciate it or understand it? And there seems to be some tensions about this. Some they wanted it, but not quite, or um, they had a difficult time understanding. And so what I think is feeding into this tension is in part different expectations by providers and patients um, and the lack of long-term outcomes, particularly for the liver donor context. Um, as and this tension is also compounded by a broader social context. Um, so I, I think that providers really expect to disclose what all these risks are, um, whether or not the patient fully understands or appreciates it, but you know, here are the risks, you've got to know it. But I'm not so sure that the, the donors totally get it and necessarily want it. Okay? And the rest of my presentation will, will explain that and unpack it a little bit more in detail so you'll see what I mean. Um, and by social context, um, a really interesting theme that came up in, in the donor stories in the narrative inquiry special issue, um, as one donor said, the medical industry promotes only the happily ever after stories. So a couple of the contributors to that special issue commented that there's kind of like this social um, pressure to not talk in any negative way about living donation because you don't want to threaten the you know the country's efforts to reduce the organ shortage. You want to there's always this pressure to promote it and be the hero and speak positively. But in fact, some people have you know some bad outcomes and they they experience pressure to not um, discuss it. Okay. So a major finding was that while donors seemed to acknowledge the information about the magnitude of donor risks, they didn't seem to fully appreciate the potential impact of the risks on their lives. So at Northwestern, the liver surgeons and the independent donor advocate, they routinely and directly reviewed the potential complications of donation and explicitly told donor candidates that they could die from donation. I mean, they, they really pounded that into people's heads. And, and in fact, in the interviews with the donors, they said that they liked that. And go figure. But it really helped them recognize the, ser so the seriousness, the severity of what they're about to go through. Um, and so when I had asked donors to identify the risks of donation to the donor. Living donors acknowledged that a list of risks was presented to them in their educational materials. They remember having received it. Um, and they, you know, they, were, they were able to recall death, bile leak, and infection as the leading risks. Um, but there was no consensus on these identified risks. And fewer than 60% of donors mentioned any given risk. So you see here. Um, you know, 60% of the 30 mentioned death. Um, and um, Diane Lapointe Rudeau, who is um, the medical director of the Living Donor Program at Mount Sinai, she had similarly found that only 70% of donors identified death from a list of risks. So while, so these findings are a little bit difficult to interpret, so they may reflect, reflect a lack of recall. Okay, and that, that's fair. Um, or it may, recall, it may reflect um, information overload. That's fine. Um, or it could reflect that the risks were simply not of high significance for donors, that they didn't care to remember. Could be any of these things. Um, and so I found some further evidence of this last point you know, that the risks may not necessarily be of importance. And um, so specifically, um, when I ask them, how would you rate donation in terms of its risk to yourself, 
said that donation is not at all to somewhat, so that's like on a Likert scale from one to five, one, two, and three, three being somewhat. 83%, the majority said it wasn't really risky to themselves. Liver donation, go figure. Um, and then 50% verbally through their comments and, and statements downplayed the risks of living donation to themselves. So they, what I mean by that is that they dismissed the complications as, as par for the course, something to deal with and get through, okay? And so, um, you know, importantly, although transplant clinicians um, really want to inform the donors about the risks so that they know what they're getting themselves into and, and can make an informed decision, um, the donors reported that they didn't really utilize this risk information for decision-making calculations. So to me, that was very surprising. Um, here are a couple of examples of how donors minimize the risks to themselves. They place responsibility for managing the risk within the clinicians or trust in the hospital. They believe that the risks are a normal and acceptable part of surgery in daily life. They also um, believe the, the likelihood of experiencing complications is low um, and that the relative impact of the complications on their health is minimal and manageable in comparison to the bigger picture of saving their loved one's life, okay, and the unlikely chances of death occurring. Remember what I told you about the voluntariness, that that kind of provides the big um, picture of what these donors are going through. Here's some illustrative uh, quotations to support this point of how living liver donors were minimizing the risks to themselves. Uh, as one person said, I think the chance for risk is so minimal that they're not important. To me, that's really striking. Another said, I don't think risk is the right word. It seems normal because, like I said, this is the biggest surgery you can have done. So I imagine there's going to be some complications, but it's reassuring knowing that none of them are life-threatening. You know, little thing here and there. That's got to be normal in a type of surgery this big. Another said, I have the list, all the statistics and the minor, minor ones, I guess. I think if the possibility of death was much, much higher than what it is, that would be the only thing. Right now, that possibility is so minuscule that it's not even on the radar, but that would be the only thing. All other complications you can deal with. So as these comments show, downplaying the risks appears to have also served as a strategy motivating living donors to proceed with the donation process. Maybe it's rationalizing. So that is, donors were reassured by their own assessment that the risks were low. So, um, you know, if we were to set aside the ethical, excuse me, like the legal requirements, um, the hospital requirements for, um, for informed consent, for um, uh, protections, for disclosure, um, I think that these findings raise a question of what is the purpose of disclosing risk information? And particularly, if the risk information was downplayed and played a little role in decision making by many donors. So, um, so here's just briefly the theoretical framework for informed consent. Um, informed decisions are really, informed consent is really designed to help people make informed treatment choices, right? To make a decision to act. Um, here are a couple quotes by Faden and Beecham. Informed, informed consents are acts of autonomous authorizing and in the case of refusals of declining. So it's an action, a decision. Okay. Um, but in this case, it wasn't so much used for decision making as some of the uh, respondents indicated. Rather, it was used for pre preparation for donation, not for decision making. And most donors had decided to donate before receiving much education from the transplant center to begin with. And that, that's a finding often found in, in the literature. So um, the information needs for decision making were distinct from the information needs relating to feeling prepared for donation. And a third of donors emphasized that information was vital for feeling prepared for donating and feeling secure in the decision that had already been made. Um, here's a, a couple more quotes um, about this, the importance that they're placing on feeling prepared. Um, so I asked, was there any other information uh, that you really relied upon to help you with your decision making? 
and the respondent said, not for the decision making, but most of the information I get was to prepare rather than to decide. I mean, this is, I mean, people are just telling you directly. There wasn't anything they could have told me to change my mind. If they had given me more information, it wasn't that it would have changed my mind, but it would have helped me feel prepared for the procedure and more aware of what to expect. So just to wrap this up here, I know we're running out of some time. Um, Providing risk information is generally touted as enabling patients, researcher, research participants, and living donors to express their self-determination for autonomous decision making. But although it's grounded in law, this perspective really minimally explains the actual thought processes used by living liver donors. Rather, an ethical analysis of the construct of informed consent should focus on identifying information that is material to their living liver donors' preparedness rather than decision making per se. Okay, so disclosing the risk statistics may be insufficient for adequately preparing living donors to appreciate the impact of a complication on a donor's life. So, um, so although they generally felt informed, they ins insufficiently understood the donation process and down played the risks in decision making. So this raises questions about comprehension. It illuminates the value of informed consent for preparation rather than decision making. Um, more comprehensible disclosure of information is needed in order to optimize the informed consent process. And it's essential, of course, that prospective donors are adequately informed and that their information needs are addressed to ensure that they're well prepared. Um, couple quick points here. So how do we do this? How can we ensure that patients are optimally informed and comprehend? Um, one suggestion, and um, uh, some of my colleagues, I don't know if, um, is Yolanda here and James out there? So I'm really pleased. So Yolanda and um, James Chan, um, we collaborated on this paper, which just got um, accepted. It's in press on shared decision making. And we propose how shared decision making can help with the informed consent process um, and enhance um, people's understanding. Um, a couple other suggestions. There's been a move in, in transplantation, I think jumping onto the bandwagon overall of utilizing you know, the internet as a, an inter, a, a great intervention. Um, to utilize interactive computer-based programs. And so the, the folks listed here, a lot of these are surgeons, not me, but Schenker and Leclerc. Um, so within the world of surgery, they're recognizing the value of um, using <coughs> computer programs to facilitate the informed consent process. Others, uh, Mal Malul here from France, they um, articulated an urgent need to produce website compliant with international standards for the quality of donor information. So um, there are a couple other interventions that are being done using the internet. I've got an intervention I'm in the middle of doing. So it's a promising one. And it's promising because I think it serves to um, standardize as well as personalize um, the information disclosure process. And by doing so, it can provide a delivery uh, that is consistent across all, part all individuals. Um, it can prevent under-informing or overwhelming people, providing um, information at a level of detail that is preferred or desired. Um, and enhances uh, patient self-determination by ensuring that people are optimally informed. Um, and these kinds of web-based programs can also uh, minimize the potential for um, fragmentation in education amongst various uh, transplant clinicians or clinicians in general within a, a given center. Um, there's a little bit of a precedent for this in the, in the VA system for um, informed consent. And I thank you all for listening. It was, uh, it was really interesting. It's the first time seeing this phenomenon of a, a difference between the risk that's communicated and the risk that's understood or expressed by uh, uh, patients in a clinical setting. But you may be aware that there is a literature about this in the research uh, informed consent setting um, in which a distinction is made between frequency type probabilities, which is a sort of fact about the world, <coughs> 
um, and belief type probabilities, which are beliefs people can have, and recognizing that there's no necessary connect, logical connection between the two. So it's logically and grammatically okay for somebody to say, I know that 20% of people you know, are going to have X complication, um, but I'm 100% sure I'm, I'm, sure I'm not going to be one of them. Now, there are two reactions uh, to that. One has been that that's okay and people can have this kind of hope. Christine Grady, for instance, has sort of talked about that. Then there's another school, and Lynn, you know, Lynn Jansen's on this, calling it unrealistic optimism, which is a cognitive bias that people have. So the people who smoke are unrealistically optimistic about their ability to avoid cancer, et cetera. And I wondered whether you looked at the transcripts or thought about um, the responses in terms of that uh, kind of a, uh, an interpretation. Is this unrealistic optimism? Is it hope? The other possibility is just cognitive dissonance. I've already decided to do this, therefore um, I, you know, none of these risks can pertain to me. And I wondered if you had some sort of, sort of psychological interpretation of it that way. Yeah, really good point. Thank you. Um, you know, I thought a little bit about this, you know, what's going on? You know, hey, wake up, you know, <laughs> smell the roses. This is a very serious situation. So, um, you know, I've tried to think about it from their standpoint. You know, it's a life and death situation. And I think on the one hand, you know, they're, um, I'm interviewing them two days before their donation. So while, you know, they have all the way up to the point of getting, you know, anesthesia to back out, I think they probably are quite resolved to proceed by that point. Some people do back out, you know, at the last minute, but not many. So in a way, I think there is this, you know, I'm gung-ho, I, I need to just do it. Um, you know, there may be risks, but I just have to save my, my loved one's life. And I think that when I had asked them, so why are you donating? I mean, that was the vast majority of the reason is, is that, you know, I have to, um, I love my mom, I love my dad or whoever, and I, I have to save them. Um, you know, it may be that there is some cognitive dissonance. I, I, I am concerned because, you know, I work with surgeons and they're telling me they have to understand the risks, but I'm not seeing that everyone necessarily does. So uh, I'm struggling. It, it's a, it, yeah. So thank you very much. Very interesting <coughs> presentation. Have you ever disqualified someone because you felt they truly had no concept of understanding, especially if it's not to a loved one, if they're just there to donate because they feel that they're calling? Um, I am not a transplant clinician, so I'm, I'm not in that um, in that position to, to make that call. But you can make the recommendation after your evaluation of them? I'm not involved. I was doing research. Oh, okay. So my <laughs> other question is you talked about that four, it's been well publicized that four living donors have died f during uh, the surgery for living donors, for livers. Is that comparable to what goes on in kidneys in the same amount of time? The no. four included kidney and liver, but I think there's... Oh, it included kidney yeah, and liver. Yeah, I think okay. there might be more than that, like five. I, I have to... It's really hard to get those news stories, actually, and some publications will uh, list them, but not all. But I know for sure there okay. are four of them. I just wondered if that was a reason for people stepping away from living kidney donation. You hear a lot about what happens if it's a liver but I just wondered if that influenced kidney donation at all. Um, I don't have any direct data. However, you know, the transplant center probably shuts down its program after that happens, and, you know, that might have some reverberation. You know, it, 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 it trans, from my understanding of talking with the surgeons when these things happen, and they happen relatively recently, that um, there's kind of a, um, a sense of, like, Let's um, kind of a cold feet, you know, feeling of cold feet. Let's let's quiet down our program. Let's be extra cautious and um, you know not take marginal candidates who are potential donors. Let's kind of scale back our our efforts and and then build up again. 
Hello, I said, Yolanda. It's Hi. nice to meet you in person, not <laughs> exactly. over the phone. So, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. I'm um, just so I can't help but say, but we do have to report this nationally to UNOS if there is a donor, and you have to report it within 24 hours. Um, otherwise, UNOS, the government will shut us down. So, it, 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 there is some safety net from the government. But my question actually is, um, Ed, have you queried or looked at what we as surgeons think we said? And if there's any veracity to what we think we said versus what we really did say? Really? Thanks very much. You made an important distinction between recall and recognition. So I, I really do wonder what that table would have looked like had you provided the recipient or the donors a list of complications as opposed to ask them to recall it out of memory. The the numbers that you gave for the recall is not that far out of line from other studies about research studies where patients in my arena, cardiac, are asked to recall what the risks are to pre prepare uh, present participate in a research study. Now that you've completed this study, what are your further plans? Do you have recommendations for how to handle a consent differently? Do you plan to do more studies? What are you expecting? Yeah, good. Always the tough question. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I have this paper almost done as far as written up, and in it I propose some of the ideas I've suggested here, but better um, comprehensibility of the information provided. Another thing that I've been thinking about is not just presenting the risks, but talking about the risks in terms of the impact on their lives. And I don't think that that's necessarily done. So how does it affect me? How does it affect my life? What will, it, what will my life be like? Um, and, and I think that that would help facilitate people's appreciation. I mean, that's really what, it's not just understand I have a 10% chance of blah, blah, blah. But how does that, if I were to get blah, 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 how would that affect me? And I think that would really help make the message sink in better. Uh, Eliza, yeah. um, I, I think one conclusion from your data might be that informed consent is working much better than you think it is or that you give it credit for. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by these numbers that you showed of the decline in adult living liver donors from 412 uh, in a decade to 194. And, and so one, one follow-up to the study that you did of 30 patients who were within two days of donating might be to interview 30 patients who had declined to donate and to find out what their recollection was of the risk factors that were given and, and how they reached their decision. Um, as you pointed out correctly, there are so many factors that, that patients might invoke to account for their refusing to go forward with the procedure. Yeah. It might not be as clean a study as I envision that it should be, but but it would be interesting to know just the difference in recall yeah. between those who didn't do it compared to those who did do it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, so, and I don't think we we are unique in the following way, but given all the rules and regulations, given um, the intensity of the focus on ethics, most programs that I know of that have at least existed for a while expend a lot of energy in making sure in a very layered way that donors are in fact informed. And as a social worker and part of the Living Donor Advocate team, um, that is definitely one of the things that I focus on very intensively in a very lengthy interview that I have with donors. It's a question that we ask at the point at which each of us sees the potential donor. And the discussion, 
Um, it's not just about who says what and who heard what, but in fact, the point you're making is very much the issue. That is, how does a donor talk about these concerns, these issues, and interpret those in the light of their own life? So that means everything, family, work, well-being, psychological issues, hopes, fears, future, everything. So I just wanted to say that to the best of my knowledge, um, on the part of myself and my colleagues, this is happening. So I, I think your, um, your presentation was really interesting, but I did just want to make the point that I know of many instances, certainly, where it, it is more the rule than the exception. And to let you know, many people are involved in it, not just the surgeon and you know, the, the, the nephrologists, but all of us who, who play a role. It's one of the reasons that the workup is, in fact, as intensive as it is. So thank you. Sure. Yes, thank you. Yep. Definitely. It's a team effort as, as required by uh, CMS. That's a good one. Thank you.